Hello everybody and welcome to this new video from Bikeotic. How do bike gears work? In this video I'm going to try and demystify and simplify what it is gears do and how to use them. Disclaimer, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an engineer and I'm not a mathematician. Everything in this video is based on my own experience of many years of riding bikes, including many years of having absolutely no idea what was going on with the gears. So here we go! In the beginning, there was a bunch of blokes who decided that running really wasn't good for their fancy suits. So they invented a contraption that you could sit down on while you ran. That was all well and good, but then some bright spark thought, well, hang on a minute. Rather than running, which is a bit of a nightmare, what we could do is put some pedals on the front of the bike. And voila! So this is great and everything, but this comes with a bit of a major problem. Imagine that this black circle is a wheel and this here is cranks with pedals. Effectively, our crank is locked to the wheel and one pedal revolution doesn't actually take us very far down the road. In fact, from one pedal revolution we travel the circumference of the wheel, if that makes sense. Now the problem with that is that you end up pedaling real fast and not really getting very far. So that's a bit of a problem. And that problem we solved with this. Ta-da! The penny farthing. So what we did there was we made the circumference of the wheel much bigger, basically to the length of your inside leg. And with the greater circumference of wheel, it meant every time you turn the pedals, we got further down the road. So we could actually go faster and not look like a kid on a tricycle. Now then, that big wheel's fine and everything, but that causes another problem. Uh, as soon as you build up that speed that we've all been craving, especially downhill, if you happen to hit a bump or a curb or something like that, bingo, you were in a bit of trouble. And they used to call it taking a header. And generally, it was fatal. So, super cool the penny farthings were, they weren't actually around for a very long time because they were incredibly dangerous. Cue the safety bicycle. So called the safety bicycle because between this and the penny farthing, there was some chance of you getting home for dinner, not sat on a gigantic front wheel. As you can see, the safety bicycle isn't that far away from what we ride today. The genius of the safety bicycle is now we've separated the wheel and the crank. No longer does one turn of the pedals have to equal one turn of the wheel. And we're now able to manipulate how fast the driving wheel turns each time you pedal. And we do that with a chain and some cogs. So, like I said, I'm no mathematician. Hopefully some of these numbers are right. You can see that by separating the crank from the driving wheel, we can manipulate the ratio between the front cog and the back cog. So if the front cog is bigger than the back cog, in this case it's a 52 tooth versus an 11 tooth, and then you put the chain on, that then locks the cogs together, and it means that when the crank spins once, because the rear cog is smaller, the back wheel will actually turn 4.7 times. So you can see that there. And what that means is because we travel the circumference of the wheel every time the wheel turns fully, if we take that circumference, and in this case, let's imagine this is a 700c wheel, it spins 4.7 times, we travel 9.17 meters. So with a nice pretty small wheel, we've managed to manipulate the amount of times it spins round and travel a good distance. And this is the beauty of using a chain and cogs to convert your leg power into forward motion. So with all that in mind, what we can now realize is that different size cogs are gonna have a different effect on how many times that rear wheel spins round when you turn the pedals. And what is really important to understand is it's the ratio between the cogs that changes that. So here we have two cogs the same. That ratio is gonna be one to one. And these bigger cogs here still have a ratio of one to one. So if you were to use these two setups on a bike, that's effectively the same thing. Because at one to one, one turn of the cranks is gonna turn the back wheel once. So both these gear ratios here are effectively the same as the setup that we had on the penny farthing. It's one to one. Now, if you put a big cog on the front, like we did in the animation just now, and a small cog on the back, that's going to make it harder to pedal because you're spinning that back wheel more times. In the example we had, it was 4.7 times you're going to spin that back wheel with one pedal revolution. So you're effectively moving your weight and the weight of the bike combined 4.7 times the circumference of the rear wheel. So that's going to be quite hard because you're going to be moving that weight quite a long way. Opposite to that is if you put that small cog on the front and put a big one on the back, it's going to have the reverse effect and you're actually going to turn the pedals 4.7 times to only turn the back wheel once. 
Now, if you're going up a super steep hill on a mountain bike, that's going to be great because the pedals will feel very light for each turn of the rear wheel. So that is going to be effectively a lot easier. So it's at this point here where we find ourselves at a bit of a crossroad. What we have is a beautifully simple, elegant and effective way to turn your leg power into forward motion and we have a very effective and economical personal transport device. And to this day, this single speed bicycle is in use all around the world in many different applications. Think bike career or velodrome racing to name a few. And in many ways, I wish that was the end of the story, but we have a major problem with this system. And that is with one gear, if the road happens to start going up or down, you'll find that your gear isn't appropriate very quickly. It's going to become too hard or too easy and you're going to wish you had more gears. And that my friends is where the big hairy monster was born. How about we put more than one gear on our bikes? <laughs> I mean that's a great idea right? We've established that by having a different size cog at the front and a different size cog at the back we can manipulate the gearing of the bicycle. So the obvious next step is if we have various size cogs we can then choose the appropriate gear to the road that we're riding on. It's a brilliant idea. The only problem with this idea is how do we get the chain to move to the front and the rear cog to create the ratio that is appropriate to the road that we're riding on at that time. So here's what the boffins came up with. Two little devices on your bike that you can control to select the gear ratio most appropriate to the road that you're traveling on. And the basic role of each of these devices is to derail the chain from one cog to another. And you guessed it, they're called derailleurs. And we use the French word derailleur. Or if you prefer, you can call them the front mech and the rear mech. Now these photos here are of my bike. And the first thing that confuses a lot of people, the front mech and the rear mech look very different. Even though they have very similar jobs to derail the chain from one cog to another. Now the big difference is that the rear mech has a second job, which is to keep the chain tensioned as we select different size cogs. So as you can imagine, going down to a smaller cog, you're not going to need as much chain. So this device is spring loaded and will take up the slack in the chain as we go down to a smaller cog. So the front mech doesn't need to do that, so it clearly looks quite a lot different. On this particular bike, you can see that the mechs are controlled by these cables that run all the way to the front of the bike to the handlebars so that I can change gears. Okay, so with this system, it's all well and good, but we have added some complications. In this next section, I'm going to attempt to break that down and show how we use all these lovely gears. But the first thing to point out is you are not a dummy. Like I say, it is quite complicated. It does take a while to get the hang of it. And sometimes when you ask people for advice, they can make you feel a bit silly. If they do, find someone else to explain it to you. So on my bike that we just had a look at, I've got a front mech shifter and a rear mech shifter on the handlebars. Now, there are instances where this is going to be different. If you're riding a pretty modern mountain bike, you won't actually have a front mech. So obviously you won't have a front mech shifter. Now, I'm a Shimano guy. That's what I've used the most of. Now, I obviously live in the UK, so unlike the rest of the world, we tend to have our front brake on the right and our rear brake on the left. No idea why we have that the other way around to everybody else, but that immediately throws in some confusion because on the right hand shifter, you're controlling the front brake, but at the same time, you're controlling the rear mech. And then on the left shifter, you're controlling the rear brake, but the front mech. So that's a bit silly. The other thing that's confusing is when we control the rear mech, we push the lever to the left to make it easier. And then we click this paddle to make it harder. With the front mech, however, we push the brake lever to the right to make it harder and then we click the paddle to make it easier. Yeah, that's confusing, isn't it? But that's the way it is. You just have to get used to it. Okay, so here's something that I want to clear up, and this is probably going to come down to personal preference, but there's quite a few different ways of describing the gear that you're in. High gear, big gear, fastest gear, low gear, small gear, slowest gear. Personally, I prefer to use the words hard, harder, or easy, easier. 
because to me, those words relate to how it actually feels. So let's take an example. If you're a 75 kilo rider with 10 kilos of kit and bike, and you stick it in a big cog at the front and a small one at the back, let's imagine every time you turn the pedals, you're moving that weight that far. So in my mind, that's gonna feel hard. So I'm gonna think of that as a hard gear. However, if we swap that round, you're only gonna be moving that weight this far. So that's gonna feel easier, and that's gonna be an easy gear. So that's how I think of it in my head. I like to use words that actually sound like they feel. Okay, let's talk about what is arguably the most important thing when it comes to gears on a bicycle. And something that hopefully you can take away from this video is when to actually change gear. And the rule here is to anticipate what's coming up and preemptively get into a gear that works well for that bit of road. So when you first start out, this can be quite tricky, especially as you're still trying to work out which shifter does what and which way to click it. But it is like driving a car. You will eventually do that without even thinking. And then you can start thinking about when to actually change gear. Personally, I'm always looking up the road and trying to anticipate what gear will work well for the gradient that I'm on. So as I gradually go up a steeper and steeper hill, I will click through the range of gears I have gradually making it easier. At no point do you want to find yourself in a really hard gear and then suddenly need to be in a really easy gear because that's when problems start. You lose momentum, it's not very efficient and puts a lot of strain on the mechanism. Likewise, when you get to the top of the hill and you start coming down the other side, it's still a good idea to match your gear to the gradient of the road or the, the track that you're riding on. If you're coasting down a hill in too low a gear and then you start pedaling, not only does it look ridiculous, but it will feel really bad when you start spinning at 200 RPM. So you're always thinking about and anticipating what gear to get into. One of the most important places to think about that is when you come to a stop. So if we come up to a T-junction, the worst thing you can do here is stop at the T-junction in a really hard gear. You might be turning right and have to cross the traffic. And if you're in a really hard gear, you're gonna find yourself stuck in the middle of the road, trying to muscle over a great big gear, and that's dangerous with cars coming. So as you come to a stop, make sure that you get into a good, appropriate, easy gear that you can pull away with nice and easily. Another little tip here, when you are changing gear, be gentle. Gears and derailleurs have been around for a long time now and they've got better and better over the years, but it's still a bit of a hack and actually derailing a chain across cogs is a bit dodgy. So as you come to change gear, and again, this is something you have to practice, just ease back the power a little bit as you feel the chain shifting across to the next cog to try and make it as gentle and smooth on your gear as possible. So if you do change your gears under full power, it probably will work, but it's not going to sound good. It's going to cause more wear to your gear and there's much more chance of you dropping a chain and that can actually be quite dangerous. Now then, having said all that, guess what causes the most confusion? And that is when to use the front mech. And this is why there's been quite a big push just lately to get rid of the front mech. So like I said earlier, most modern mountain bikes and a lot of new gravel bikes have totally done away with the front mech, have a single cog at the front, and we're now up to 12 cogs on the back. It makes complete sense to just click up and down and you change gear sequentially. However, if you're on a bike with a front mech, that's a bit more complicated. And the reason it's complicated is because we have some overlap of the gear ratios. So if we have a look at this setup here, it's fairly common on an endurance road bike. We've got two cogs at the front, a 50 tooth and a 34 tooth. And at the rear, we've got 11 gears ranging between 11 and 32 tooth cogs. So this graphic here shows all the gears that you can have if you're using the 50 tooth at the front. And here are all the gears you can have if you use the 34 tooth at the front. So in theory, you've actually got 22 gear ratios that we can click into here. But actually, as you can see here highlighted, there's a big bunch of gears that all overlap. So if we take those out from the 22 gears, we've got eight redundant and 14 usable. Now the problem is you can't just sequentially click through those. And this is what makes having a front mech quite confusing. So when do you change your front mech? It does come down to personal preference a bit. It comes down to how far you're thinking up the road. And again, it takes a fair bit of practice to get good at it. But let's imagine you're cycling up a hill. You're in the big 50 tooth chain ring at the front. You get to about this gear here 
and you can see up ahead that it's getting steeper. Now, generally modern road bike gears aren't going to give you any idea of what gear you're in on the handlebars, so a lot of this is done by feel. But here's what you do. You get to here, and in a sec I'm going to explain why you'd probably do it here rather than on these gears. You're going to click down to the smaller 34 tooth cog at the front. Now as you do that, the chain is still going to be on the same cog at the back, so that's actually this gear here. So as you can see, that's quite a big jump up to this gear here. So what you would do in this setup to go to the next sequential gear from this one is this gear here. You're going to need to shift the rear derailleur one or two clicks down to a smaller gear to get the correct sequence. Now that sounds super confusing. It's something you're going to have to practice. And personally what I do is I do the front one first and I, I basically pause my pedaling. I wait a heartbeat for it to change the front mech and then I'll double tap the rear mech to shift that back down two clicks. You can have to get a feel for that on your bike. Some bikes it's only one click. But it is complicated, it is confusing, and that's the problem with a front mech. Okay, so when you just thought that this could not get any more confusing, let's talk about cadence. And I can hear you groaning and saying, oh good grief bikeotic. I thought this was supposed to be a simple guide to gears. Apologies, what can I do? But cadence is quite a big deal, and there's a couple of things to think about here. And as with all things cycling, it's not clear cut. It's on a spectrum, and at one end of the spectrum we've got grinding, as in pedalling quite slowly, and at the other end of the spectrum we've got spinning, which is basically pedalling quite fast. Now depending on how well you're trained, most human beings can pedal comfortably anything between 60 RPM to 110, something like that. And everybody's different, everybody has their preference, but the thing to realise is that you tend to be using different systems within your body. If you're grinding, you're using more your muscle power, and if you're spinning, you're using your lungs and your cardio system. So we're not going to go into this too much, but if your goal is to complete long distance type endurance events or sportives, you might want to start training at slightly higher leg speed, get the old crank spinning round, because it's all very well putting big power through at low cadence, but you are going to tire your muscles out quite quickly. So you were out on the club run the other day, having fun, pedaling away, and the old bloke in the group came up to you and said, you're cross-chaining. You looked at him blankly and said, oh, sorry about that. But unfortunately you had no clue what he was talking about. Well, all it is, as you can see from these diagrams here, if you're in the big chain ring at the front and the big one at the back, the chain is going to be at quite an acute angle. Likewise, if you're in the small chain ring at the front and the small one at the back, Again, the chain is going to be at quite an acute angle. Now, the only real problem with this is, depending on the bike and how extreme the cross-chaining is, it might make a bit of a nasty noise and it might wear out your components a bit quicker. But at the end of the day, it's kind of up to you whether you want to cross-chain or not. I guess the recommendation is not to, but next time someone has the audacity to tell you, then at least you can just shrug your shoulders. So another question that pops up quite a lot is, is it okay to change gears while you're pedaling out of the saddle? And while it is possible, I would say personally I don't do it. It makes for a pretty clunky gear change, and if the chain came off while you were doing that, it might end in tears. Okay, after all that, let's take a breath. I thought we'd do a bit of jargon busting in this section. First up, group set. A group set tends to be made up of all the components that are bolted to a frame to make it into a bicycle. Brakes, rear mech, front mech, chain, cassette, crank, shifters, bottom bracket, drivetrain, all the bits and bobs used to convert your leg power into forward motion. Feel free to pause this image and get to know all the different names for everything. Quite often bikes will be quoted as being 10 speed, 11 speed, 12 speed, and what that's referring to is the amount of cogs on the rear cassette. This cassette here on the SRAM Force ETAP group set is a 12 speed. Don't then be confused by 20, 22 and 30 speed. 20 refers to a 10 speed with two cogs at the front. 22 is 11 speed with two cogs at the front. And 30 would be 10 speed with three cogs at the front or a triple chain set. We call it a chain set in the UK. In the US they call it a crank set. And on the road bikes there tends to be three that you can choose from. Compact, semi-compact and standard. If you're going for a standard crank set, you're going to want to be a pretty proficient rider. And if you're looking for an endurance bike where you're going to be doing a lot of hills, you'd probably want to go for a compact. Me, personally, I have a semi-compact and I've done the unthinkable. I've put a 34 tooth inner chain ring on, which Shimano advise against you doing, but for me, it seems to work fine. So I've got the best of a compact and a semi-compact. 
a 5234. You can get a triple chain set. You don't see them very often, but you might get them on a touring bike or something like that. That would be called a three by. If like we spoke about earlier, you've only got one front chain ring, then it's a one by, probably a mountain bike or a gravel bike. Or you've got a two by, which is what this is here. And that's pretty common on road bikes. People quite often refer to something called the granny ring. That used to refer to the tiny little ring on a three by but generally now we use it to refer to the smallest inner ring. This bike here has a mechanical group set. In this instance, it's from Shimano. It's the Ultegra group set, and it's actuated by cables that run through the frame up to the shifters. Mechanical group sets are your cheapest option, or if you want to splash the cash, you could go for an electronic group set, such as this one here, which is the SRAM ETAP Access group set, completely wireless, the shifters and the mechs have batteries on them and they communicate to each other wirelessly. What that means is you don't need the cables coming through the bike. When you click the shifters to change gear, the motors inside the mech position the chain over the correct cog. Shimano's version is called DI2. Neither of those two electric group sets should be confused with an electric bike, which is what this is, which has a motor in it, which as you pedal, it feeds in some power to assist you. Now at this point in the video, I was gonna talk about how different bikes have different gear ratios, but looking at this slide now, it just looks so complicated. I'm not gonna bother. If you do wanna have a look at this, feel free to pause the video and check it out by all means. Now, when you buy a new bike or you have already bought a bike, but you feel like the gears aren't quite right for you, there are many, many options out there to change the gearing on your bicycle. This is quite a big topic in itself, and it usually revolves around you swapping out the cassette for a different set of ratios. And if this is something you want to know more about, leave a comment down below and maybe we'll make another video on it. So my closing note on this video is although it sucks, try and keep your drivetrain nice and clean. Hopefully one day they'll invent completely new system that isn't completely open to the mud and the muck and the grime because if you ride three times a week having to clean your chain three times a week is a pain and remember once you've cleaned it you need to give it a good lubing and there's various different ways we can do that again maybe that's another video let me know what you think in the comments down below and if you like this video give it a thumbs up and if you haven't already how about subscribing to my channel until next time